Amen. Good morning. So my name is Ed Stetzer, and I'm going to be our chapel speaker today. You may wonder why I'm over here, because there's a big hole in the floor right there. I'm assuming for an orchestra, and so moved over here so I wasn't so far away. Um, I actually have the privilege of serving as the executive director of the Billy Graham Center and a professor at Wheaton College out in uh, suburban Chicago. And uh, there you go. One person from Chicago is very enthusiastic about that. I appreciate that. Um, and I want to share with you today from a series of four passages, and they're called Commissions of Jesus. But there's a reason I want to talk to you about them today. Um, I get sometimes uh, a lot of hate mail when you write when you write in the public space, and so uh, I've had my email address doxed and posted online on white supremacist websites. I have people send letters to my house, sometimes pictures of my house, threatening me, my family, and others when I've spoken up on issues of race and issues of of uh, things that maybe somebody should say or somebody shouldn't say. But what's interesting is the is the most uh, negative feedback I ever got. And the most calls and letters and emails was actually an article that I thought was pretty innocuous in CNN. And so I wrote the article in CNN uh, about, well, it was last Easter. And I, I wrote, and well, the title of the article was, again, pretty innocuous, is why your Christian friends keep inviting you to church at Easter time. And so, and I put it, they wrote it, I wrote the article and they, uh, and they put it up there on the front page and they put it up on Good Friday and it became actually uh, one of the most read articles over the whole weekend. It wasn't a big news weekend, so it was actually right in the middle of the CNN.com front page. Over a million people read it and it appears that about half a million people were mad about it. And so they, they sent letters, they, uh, they actually called my workplace, uh, they uh, threatened people, they, they, they called some of my colleagues, they were, we finally stopped answering the phones at the Billy Graham Center for that day. And, but sometimes when we'd see what they'd say, they found my social media pages and just filled them up with comments. What they were saying is, because in that article I basically said that Jesus' last words, his words between his resurrection and his ascension, right? So these are the last earthly words of Jesus, and so we might want to spend particular time and give them a particular import in our, in, in our lives. As I said, Jesus' last words should be our first priority. And so, and so, but people didn't like that at all. And so, matter of fact, they said, you're basically telling Christians to bother other people, and so in punishment of that, they sought to bother me. And they were quite aggressive at it, some of them very, very aggressive. You see, part of the reality is, though, there's a little bit of an idea out there. And I'll give you an example. It's by a famous quote, uh, and, and many non-Christians and Christians alike quote it. You've probably seen it on Facebook. It goes like this. It says, uh, it's, by, it's quite attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, and it says, Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. It's a beautiful idea. It's the idea that you'd kind of show by your life the reality of the gospel and so I see it all the time and many people actually posted that on my Facebook page and more preach the gospel at all times if necessary use words there's only two problems with the quote from St. Francis first St. Francis never said it so there's that matter of fact it was a hundred years after his death anybody even attributed to him and remember the words of Abraham Lincoln don't believe all the quotes attributed to me on the internet because the reality it can be very confusing well, number one, he never said it. Number two, it's really bad theology. The reality is, is that the Jesus that we love, the Jesus that would cause us and lead us to care for the hurting, to go to the margins, to minister to the least of these, is the Jesus who gives us the four commissions I want us to look at today. So if you have a Bible you want to follow along, great. It's number one on our outline. I'm going to just build a sentence. Let me tell you the whole sentence right now. We are sent to all different kinds of people with a message empowered by the Spirit. Very simple outline, four points. Number one, we are sent. So in John chapter 20, Jesus is speaking, and it says he appears behind closed doors, and he shows up there in the room where the disciples are hiding. They're in fear of the Jewish leaders. He appears to them. He says, peace once. He shows them his hands and his side. And then in John 20, 21, he says this, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you, Jesus said. Now why does that matter? Because in doing so, he's spoken to his disciples 2,000 years ago in an upper room. But one of the ways we read and understand the Bible is when he's talking to his group of disciples, he's talking to us. And so 2,000 years later, we hear the words of Jesus, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Not only does he say that, but he says that after 40 times in the Gospel of John before this, identifying himself as being sent by God. He talks about how the Father sent me. I've been sent for the fa by the Father, the Father's purpose, and more. So what I want you to m not miss is that we are sent every day of our Christian lives 
on mission for Jesus because Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Now, most of us think of being sent as something that missionaries receive, and they do, and we need more, not less, cross-cultural missionaries. Or maybe you've been sent on a mission team. Um, I, I would wonder, any, any of you been on an international cross-cultural mission trip? Just raise your hand for just a second. Okay, hands all over the place. Okay, good. So me, me too, and I love to take my students there. I remember taking my students a few years ago to a place in West Africa called Ghana. And while there in Ghana, Ghana was amazing, beautiful, wonderful people for many reasons. But one of the things I think I like the most is that uh, the people in this particular people group we were working with actually consider being a fat man incredibly attractive. I don't know why you're laughing. Um, but I love the idea that I entered into the country and I was the best looking person in the whole room, sometimes in the whole village. And so, so I kind of walked through Apatrapa, which is a community outside of Kumasi, the capital, and it was really funny. I mean, people would just point and say, you, you look good. And I just wave that wave back to them. And, and it's funny because we don't mention that. You know, some you're not supposed to say things. But in, in Ghana, it's quite the opposite, right? Because you look great. Here's two chairs for you. You are that awesome. <laughs> and it's so funny because we wouldn't do that here, right? Culturally, we wouldn't do that. But there it's something that's celebrated as the beauty of the moment showed. So uh, we were there on a mission trip. And so um, I brought about 20 students. The first week, we kind of divided up into different churches, uh, African Ghanaian churches. And I was by myself at the church I went to, and it was actually about the size of this room. Um, and I was the only, uh, I was the only white person in the room. I kind of sat over here, and the, uh, the music began to play, and it was wonderfully, uh, wonderfully expressive and beautiful, and people began to dance in the midst of the service, and, and the service went on for, I assure you, a very long but wonderful time. And so I, I don't dance. Uh, it's in the Bible that I shouldn't. Second Opinions, chapter 4, verse 11, Ed Stetzer should not dance. Um, so I follow Second Opinions on everything I can. So, so I'm sort of seated over there, and they're dancing, but I, I, you know, I, I want to cross cultures, so I'm participating at some level. So I'm sort of, I, I sort of clap along, and I sort of you know, lift one leg, which is the Baptist version of dancing, right? So I'm sort of doing that. You do two, both feet, you're Pentecostal, they ask you to leave. So I uh, got to stick with the one and just go there. And so I'm kind of keeping it on the down low, though I am incredibly attractive and everybody in the room knows it. Um, so, and I stand out, right? I'm, I'm the only white person in the whole room. And so, and I'm thinking I'm doing fine, sort of keeping it, you know, keeping it over here until the offering. Now, in your church, probably they pass a plate or a basket or something. But in a whole lot of the Southern Hemisphere, I don't know why this is, but I've seen it across the world in, in Brazil and in Africa and other places, uh, South America and more, um, the, what we find is, is that a lot of churches actually take the offering up front. So they might put out some stations, and during the time of worship, people come up and drop in their offering. Well, at this church in Africa, what they did is they rolled out a barrel right there in the front. So a thousand people, just like you about here, with a big barrel in the front, I'm over there, and I realize what's about to happen. They are all going to dance their way to put the offering in the barrel. Now, the problem is second opinions, and Ed Stetzer does not dance. And so my thought is, because I'm kind of close to the front, they, they would have guests sit up front, and they, they honor you, and somebody asks you to say something. Um, and so i got to get from there to there, but the problem is a thousand people can't all go to the barrel at the same time. So what they do is they got a plan. Cultures are smart. People are smart. Because they do it different than you doesn't mean that they're not smart. And so the plan is a thousand people got to get up there. You obviously got to form a line, and you're already dancing. So the solution is a thousand-person dance conga line. And the problem is I'm at the end of that line. So we start dancing, the people over here come up, and, we, and I start going up every aisle, and, I, and I, at this point I can't not dance. Now I kind of grew up in the 70s, so the only way I know how to dance involves pointing, and so I'm sort of just going around pointing, and the whole, the whole church is thinking, second opinions, man, second opinions, you don't need to participate. But here's the thing I don't want you to miss. Now I bet I'm not the only person who got a little uncomfortable on a mission trip. In this case, dancing, and maybe made a whole lot of other people uncomfortable as well. So I, I'm not the only person who's walked that journey. My guess is when you're on a mission trip, you ate something that was really outside of your comfort zone. People got too close to you, or, or, or maybe they were too loud or too soft, or maybe, maybe you were too loud, and, and, and they don't, you've gotten uncomfortable if you've been on a mission trip. 
But here's the thing I don't want you to miss. Jesus is actually saying to his disciples then and 2,000 years later to us that life is actually a mission trip. And so we ought to expect that in the name of Jesus and for the fame of Jesus, we might hear his words, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. We might, having heard those words, say, I'm willing to get uncomfortable at times to cross barriers of economics and race and relationship, maybe just to have a conversation. One of the most terrifying things for some people is to just have a basic conversation about how Jesus has changed me. But Jesus didn't say, you've arrived. Some Christians I know, they act, they arrived. I'm here, you come to me, I've got it all together. I, I don't have it all together, but Jesus sent me. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Now what we know from the Bible is that actually God is a sender by his very nature. So therefore, he sends, right? God the Father sends the Son. We can look through, uh, the Spirit is sent. We can, we can look over and over again. God's people are sent. Abraham is, later Abraham is sent. And Isaiah actually hears from the Lord, here I am, Lord, send me. And what I'm asking you to consider today is to say what Isaiah said. Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. And to be willing to go wherever or to whomever he calls you. Here I am, Lord, send me. Can I ask you to say that out loud with me just once? Here I am, Lord, send me. Let's try it. Here I am, Lord, send me. Let's try it again. Here I am, Lord, send me. So we start the first commission of Jesus. Number one, we are sent as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Number two, to all different kinds of people. I want you to look with me, if you're following along in your Bible, to the Great Commission. There's four commissions of Jesus. This one gets called the Great Commission because of its specificity and depth. Here's what it says. Jesus is again speaking. This is Matthew 28 beginning at verse 18. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. All authority probably referring back to that which was before, where he went through this temptation, when the devil took him up to a high pillar and said, all this can be yours if you fall down and worship me. At the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, at the end, Jesus says, no, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to give all that I commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, the Great Commission is called Great because there's a great amount of things in there to cover, and we can't cover them all. But I do want to focus on just uh, three words in English. It says, go make disciples of all nations. Of all nations in the Greek, which is the language the New Testament was originally written in, it's panta ta ethne. Panta ta ethne. Now, 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 what would that mean to them? Whenever you're trying to read and interpret the Bible, I'm doing the broadest lectures, I explained a little of this yesterday. One of the things you do is you ask, what would it have meant to the original hearers? So the people who heard this probably thought of the Gentiles, the non-Jewish world. But it's a pretty broad panta ta ethne. It's a whole lot of different kinds of people in that world. Now, Jesus didn't say to go to all nations the way we think of nations, so that's how people quote in English. The Great Commission, go make disciples of all nations. Here's why. Because the idea of a nation, the way we think of it today, didn't even exist when Jesus uttered these words. The idea that you have a country with a border and passports and, and border control and nationality, they, they didn't exist. There were some ideas like citizenship that existed, but that was empire citizenship in the Roman Empire. Jesus didn't use the word for empire. He used the words panta ta ethne, and ethne comes from the same root word of our English word, ethnic. So the disciples knew that was Gentiles, but that's all different kinds of people. That's why, number one, we are sent, number two, to all different kinds of people. So Jesus sends us to all different kinds of people, and then he models that as well. For example, the phrase you've heard before, the Good Samaritan, there's actually Good Samaritan laws in almost every state of the country where if you try to help somebody with sincerity, but you fail and you mess up, you're not legally liable because you're just being a good Samaritan. But the reality is the phrase good Samaritan was an unheard of phrase by Jews in that day. So when Jesus put the word good next to the word Samaritan, you see the Samaritans were the people nobody liked. It was literally the neighborhood, in this case the country, that you walked around to avoid, not even always because it was dangerous, but because they were just those kind of people with the wrong religion, the wrong morality, the wrong history, stay away from them. Jesus puts it together and says, good, Samaritan. So we're called to go to all different kinds of people. That means the Pocot in Africa, the Quechua 
in the highlands of Peru, the Ebon in Malaysia. And so maybe as you're here at Anderson University, you're preparing and praying about, Lord, what would you have me to do? I want to encourage you, if you'll pray that prayer, here I am, Lord, send me. He might send you far to a people group that's never heard the gospel. Less than 3,000 now have no gospel witness. Goes down every year. They're what we call unengaged, unreached people groups. Then there's unreached people groups. That's a larger category. And so the opportunity is before us. And some of you, you might say, well, Ed, I'm, I'm actually preparing for a vocation in, in business or entrepreneurship or banking or teaching. Can I tell you, the door to global mission is wide open to all kinds of fields. If we'll say, here I am, Lord, send me. But he's not going to send all of us there. And sometimes he sends us to a different kind of people even here. Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, one of my students, I was a seminary professor years ago for three long years, and one of my students uh, planted a church while, uh, while, we, while I was there, while I was his professor. We, we started, we talked in my living room about it, he started a Bible study, and this church uh, began to grow. Now, you, you wouldn't necessarily know Louisville, I would think, but it's in the Highlands District of Louisville, which is sort of this art and croissant district. It's all the uh, artists slash waiters who are trying to break into the art field. And, um, and Daniel and Mandy were their names. Daniel and Mandy Montgomery are their names. And they, they, they moved into the community. They had a burden from God. Why? Because they knew that Jesus had sent them, and this is the people to whom Jesus had sent them. And so now here they're on mission, and they go plant a church. It's called Sojourn. It would later grow to thousands, but a couple years in, it had about 200 people, and Daniel asked me to come preach. And I was, so I walked into the room, and as I walked into the room, I looked around, and I was the oldest person in the room by 15 plus years. Uh, at the time, I was in my, uh, I think, late 30s, and most of the people there were in their early 20s, and it was clearly, I mean, it, it was not, it was a few years older than maybe this room. And as I walked in, I realized, okay, this is going to be different because they looked all very different from me, right? They first, first of all, they were all younger. I mentioned that. The band was actually up front, and they were, they were actually getting ready to... Uh, to play, they were, play, they were pra practicing their music, and there were six of them, they're all young, young men, six of them across the front, and they all had uh, jeans with, with holes in them, they had black sneakers, they had black t-shirts, and, and they had dark hair with blonde highlights and big, thick, black rim glasses, all six of them, because they didn't want to be squeezed into a mold by society. <laughs> and as I noticed, I walked, I was about halfway up, and halfway up the aisle, and I, I noticed that the music was, was too loud. Now, now, again, at this point, I had actually been a church planter for 15 years. I'd planted churches among the urban poor in the inner city of Buffalo, New York, three churches in Erie, Pennsylvania, all of which were contemporary. And I've literally heard the words, Pastor, I'd come to your church, but the music's too loud. I would guess hundreds of times in the 15 or so years up till the point that I walked into Sojourn. And I've said, I've thought hundreds of times, and I've said out loud a few, listen, if that music's too loud, you're, you're, you're probably too old. And then I'm walking down this aisle and I think to myself, that music's too, <gasps> I'm that guy now. <laughs> so I, I got up and I preached and I, I looked around. And there were a lot more tattoos per capita than at my home church. And a lot more facial jewelry per capita than at my home church. As a matter of fact, it was, um, people had, I mean, you know, nose rings, whatever, you know, earrings, whatever. But they had like eyebrow rings then with a little chain that would go to the cartilage ring on the ear, then it would go down to a subdermal, and, 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 I, and I just want to say, is that real? Oh, just to pull it and see. I didn't. I was on my best behavior, but it looked to me like half the church fell into a tackle box and came to church that night. <laughs> no, I know some of you are deeply offended that I made a joke about that, and so just, just move on. It's going to be okay. Um, it's all good. So, so, but, but I get up to preach, and um, it's kind of fascinating because when I'm preaching, um, I don't know, it's, there's such a different cultural context, but, but they seem to track along, wonderful church that loved the Lord deeply, and then I go sit down sort of over here, and they have the Lord's Supper that night. They have the Lord's Supper every time they gather, and they, they would come and partake of the Lord's Supper 
Uh, but the associate pastor, Les, was there that night. And he said, listen, if you're not a Christian, this wouldn't be for you. If you, have un, uh, if you have unrepentant sin or if you have unreconciled relationship, this isn't for you. So they just begin to let people come as they're ready, and they do. But half the church doesn't get up. They're just around praying and preparing. And I'm sitting over there, a few seats over from me, is a young woman, and she's actually crying. And then somebody comes from the front, comes back to her, begins to pray with her. And they sort of see, I don't know what they're talking about, but there's something changes. And then she comes up because people are actually taking deeply seriously the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist that night, people's lives are being impacted by it. And a few minutes later, there are two baptisms. And at my church, we do baptism. I just ask them, have you received Christ? They say yes. And then I say, upon your public profession of faith, we baptize you. Here, they give, there are two young men being baptized. They gave them the microphone. And so this is new believer, unfiltered testimony in front of church. And the first one gets up and he talks about sexual brokenness and addiction and how he got trapped in this cycle and then Jesus came and changed him and still changing him and people are crying and, and, and applauding at the same time. And then another guy comes up, young guy comes up and, and he talks about how he hated his dad growing up because his dad was an alcoholic and then he found himself now addicted to drugs but now he's taking Jesus in his heart and he's changed him and he's changing him. And I'm thinking to myself, these people are not like me. These people are different. There's a cultural distance between us. But thank God somebody heard the words of Jesus to go to all different kinds of people like an art community in this part of Louisville. Now, now the sad part is there are some Christians who will spend their time critiquing that church. And I'm just going to celebrate that church in front of you and everywhere that I can. Because I saw the lives changed. Church was 200 that night and later would grow on to be thousands because they came a place where anybody could come and be changed by the power of the gospel. See, Jesus sends us to all different kinds of people. Now, I made fun of their music a little bit, saying it was too loud. I apologize. I believe God can use any form of music for his glory and honor. There's no such thing as Christian music. There's only Christian lyrics. God can and use any form of music for his glory and honor except country western. To be fair, he could, but he's a loving God. And so, <laughs> as such, he does not. By the way, I've lived in Nashville the last 10 years. I had to move two years ago because of the restraining order. And so now I live in Chicago. Used to live in Nashville. You can see why I had to leave. Actually, it was about two weeks after I was at Sojourn, I was at a church in Oklahoma City. Uh, we got there late and walked in and... Uh, but my flight was delayed, and so I got in about 6.10, evening service started at 6, and they were already singing that country western devil music, but they were singing Victory in Jesus. I'm sure you've sung Victory in Jesus at some point in chapel. Here's how they sang it, though. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, yee-haw, and we gave it that. And I'm, you know, I'm from New York. I live outside of New York City growing up, and I walk in, and, and when they, yee-haw, I didn't know what to do. I thought, they just yeed, followed by a subsequent verbal haw in the midst of a song. I have no idea how to respond to this moment. And then I looked, and they were all seated. You know, most of you here are kind of seated next to each other, but up here, there's this demon class, and none of them are they're afraid to actually touch shoulders. So there's actually a person and a space, and a person and a space. And so I actually looked, and I'm coming in, and I'm looking, why are they all seated one spot apart? And I look over the first few, it's a person and a hat, and a person and a hat, and a person and a hat. I'm not making any jokes about country music at this church. In fact, I get up to preaching, and they start preaching back at me. I'm like, you know, the Lord's speaking to your heart. They're like, preach it, brother. Come on, preach it. I'm like, I'm trying. Stop yelling. <laughs> Let me preach. <laughs> so after church, we went, to, we went to Western Sizzler. It's the law there. And we went through the feeding trough, and we sat down at the table. And the pastor was up getting some ice cream which is what we pastors need more of is ice cream. And I'm sitting down with this guy. His name is Bill or Bob. It wasn't Billy Bob. That'd be funny, but I'd be lying. <laughs> and I got to tell you, uh, Bill had lived, Bill looked like he lived a rough life. So I asked him, I said, what's your story? And he said to me, preacher. He called me preacher. He said, preacher, I got out of prison six months ago. Many of my undivided attention. He said, 
So he named church. He didn't come out of, uh, out of prison a Christian. You know, there's actually a thriving church behind the walls. Dr. Karen Swanson leads our Institute for Prison Ministries in our Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College, and I'm struck and amazed by how God has worked behind the walls. But he came out, not a Christian, but said, I've got to change my life. And so he said he visited this church, and he named the church. I don't remember the name of the church. I'm kind of glad I don't. He said, Preacher, I went to this church, and I couldn't afford to go there, and I didn't know what that meant. I didn't ask. Maybe I thought later that, you know, sometimes churches say, well, let's all go out to lunch afterwards to a place, and some people just can't afford it, and they're left out of our community. And he said, Preacher, I went to this other church. He named the church, and they said they didn't want somebody who's an ex-con coming to that church. And then he said this. This church, you were at, I think it was Crossroads. He said, Preacher, I came to Crossroads. And here I got radically saved and washed in the blood of Jesus. And I got to tell you, that's, that music's not my culture. Um, I got to learn to cross those cultures. But thank God somebody heard the words of Jesus to go to all different kinds of people. See, somebody says, here I am, Lord, send me. And it's not just pastors, right? It's every one of us. This is key. It's not just that missionaries are sent. It's not just that pastors are sent. It's that all of us are sent. Would you say it again with me? Here I am, Lord, send me. Let's do it. Here I am, Lord, send me. Number three in our outline. Number one, we are sent. Number two, to all different kinds of people. Number three, with a message. Now, this is a little lesser known commission of Jesus. It's in Luke chapter 24. Jesus is again speaking. All of these are Jesus' words, his commissions, his last earthly words between his resurrection and his ascension. And here in Luke chapter 24, Jesus says it this way. He speaks about his role and what's going to happen moving forward he says to them the messiah it says this is what is written this is luke 24 46 this is what is written the messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning at jerusalem you are witnesses of these things so the message is actually quite clear here and here's part of the challenge because depending on where you're from have you lived in nashville for the last 10 years there's sort of a sense that the message for many Christians is I should invite my friends to church to be good people. And what I want you to know, that's actually not the message of the gospel. The, the message of the gospel is not you do. The message of the gospel is Jesus did. And because of what Jesus has done, you respond by grace and through faith and repentance and receiving the new life. So what happens, though, sometimes when Christianity gets tied into closely a culture, as it often is across parts of this country and even parts of the world, the message gets reduced to come to church and turn over a new leaf when the message of the gospel is you're dead in your trespasses and sins and you need new life. And receiving that new life changes everything. But, but the challenge is not to forget the message. I have, uh, I have three daughters. I love that. Uh, 14, 16, and 20. My oldest daughter is a student at Wheaton College. She actually decided to go to Wheaton College um, about three years ago. She was really excited about going away to school. We lived in Nashville. She was going to go off to Wheaton College, be a student at the music conservatory. She's studying opera and vocal performance. And she's so excited about going away to school. And two months after she announced, I said, hey, guess what? We're coming too. So that's like the worst nightmare for a student going off to college. But like a lot of schools, I mean, we never see each other. She's, uh, she's on the undergrad side. I teach in the graduate school. And I've seen her twice randomly on campus, but we have a rule. I'm not actually allowed to make eye contact unless she makes eye contact first. So I follow that rule. We're going to go to dinner tonight, so it's all good. But, uh, um, but I remember one time we were sitting in Nashville, and there was something I needed to tell Kristen's her name. Something I needed to tell Kristen. And I, uh, so I got up from downstairs. There's stairs up right in the middle of her house. So I got up from the couch. I was typing something. And had to go tell her. So I actually quickly went upstairs. You know, you hear me going up the steps and kind of quickly. And I moved down to her door. Her door's closed. And so I knocked on her door and she heard me coming. So she opens the door quickly and says, what, dad? And I'm standing there and I forgot what I wanted to tell her. Now, again, this happens to you later, but it does happen to you. Um, And so I just said to her, I just came to tell you I love you. And she totally fell for it. I mean, she totally believed me. I mean, she knew that I loved her, but she totally thought that's why I was coming. See, but here's the thing. I don't want you to miss this, right? A lot of Christians, particularly some parts where there's Christianity and culture is mixed together, that being a Christian is being a good person, sometimes those Christians have sort of forgotten the actual message is much more radical than that. See, if you're not a follower of Jesus, it's not just you're a good person or a bad person. You can be a lot nicer than some Christians I know, I assure you. 
But the reality is, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're spiritually dead in your trespasses and sins, needing new life. That's why Jesus calls it being born again. And so that's the message that is so essential, is that we might grasp that we need new life, not a turning over a new leaf, not trying harder, not I got trouble, I got too, I got too connected with this or that, but instead it's knowing Christ. But it also relates to our theme, doesn't it? You see, we're sent to all different kinds of people with a message. Say, but Ed, I'm not a preacher, but here's the reality. You're a Christian, and if you're a Christian, you've actually been given this message. And so when you're working at the bank, or you're teaching at the school, or you're working in the architecture firm, or you're a doctor, or you're a nurse, or you're driving a truck, or you're working a factory line, whatever it may be, you've been given a message to tell. And I know that it's awkward sometimes, because we're sometimes anxious about how people will receive it. But I want you to know, I want you to know that Jesus called does not single out a few, it's for all. That's why we say, here I am, Lord, send me. Number four, and finally, you know what it means when a chapel speaker says, finally, absolutely nothing. But it will for me. Number one, we're sent. Number two, it's all different kinds of people. Number three, with a message. Number four, empowered by the Spirit. There's actually one more here, and it's an ax. Uh, Which is also, I mean, Luke wrote both Luke and Acts, and so it's kind of an extension of what Luke wrote in Luke 24. But in Acts 1.8, here's what he says. Jesus says, he says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, again, there's different denominations here, but I just wonder, are there any, like, Pentecostal charismatics here? Would you raise both hands? Raise both hands. You're, You're used to it. There you go. Keep them up. Keep them up. You do this in church for hours. Keep them up high. Those people like this verse. Thank you. You can put your hands down. The Baptists, and here's the thing about like Baptists and Pentecostals. They're, they kind of have the same rules and the same regulations. You can't do certain things. You're in the same region of the country. It just seems Pentecostals are happy about it. And so it's a little different feel sometimes. <laughs> I'm a Baptist, just to put that out there. Um, but, you know, we see the Holy Spirit and we think, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that to do these things is not in your own strength, but it's in the power that the Holy Spirit sends. So Jesus says, he says, you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. By the way, you're sitting, Anderson, South Carolina, was the ends of the earth when Jesus uttered these words. So it's for all of us everywhere. So we look through the commissions of Jesus, what we find is a consistent theme. We are sent to all different kinds of people with a message empowered by the Spirit. And I don't want you to miss this. There's a whole lot more that these verses mean. I mean, the Great Commission, I just gave just two two words, three words, just briefly. But what I don't want you to miss is this, right? Is that that, that, that a lot of people, this is a message that they they maybe have a struggle living. And and maybe they have a struggle coming here and teaching, right? Matter of fact, if we listed it on the posters, Ed Stetzer is going to be talking about the commissions of Jesus. You might not have chosen this chapel to come to. Nancy Ortberg once wrote in a book that there are three things that will draw a crowd among young adults. She was leading a young adult ministry at the time. She said, you can talk about three things that will draw a crowd. Sex, talk about sex, put it on posters, people will come. The end times, people will come. Or thirdly, will there be sex in the end times? That's Nancy Ortberg. If you want to tweet that, don't cite me in that tweet. But here's the reality. Like I wrote in that CNN article that led to all of the hate, is at the end of the day, the reason that people keep inviting their friends to church is because Jesus told us to. But he told us more than that. I just said that simply at Easter time. But Jesus told us more than that, and it's a reminder that we are sent. If you're a Christian, you're sent by Jesus to all different kinds of people, not just people like you with a message of repentance and forgiveness of sins that might be hard to articulate, but I want you to learn and grow in, but to do so in the power of the Spirit. Why? Because those are Jesus' words, and Isaiah's response is a wonderful response. Would you say it with me one more time? Let's say it together. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Would you pray with me? Father, we acknowledge that by your grace and your goodness, you have redeemed us called us by name, and sent us on a mission for your name's sake. Father, I pray for the men and women here that you would speak to their hearts, not my words, but your prompting. 
that in the power of the Holy Spirit, they might respond to your leadership. Just with your head bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment, I'm not asking a lot, I'll ask you to do this. If you're a follower of Jesus, I want to ask you today just to mentally put your yes on the table. Just say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to be a banker, I'm going to do it for your glory, or where you call me. Just put your yes on the table. I'm going, to, I'm going to drive truck, I'll put my yes on the table. Whatever it is, you put your yes on the table, let God put it on the map. To engage whoever, whomever, and wherever he calls you. And just with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I've had you say it four times, could you make those words of Isaiah a prayer with me? If it's the prayer of your heart, just, let's say it just quietly to the Lord together. Here I am, Lord, send me. In Jesus' name, amen.